Hey there, friends. Welcome to Kurt Vonnegut's, the podcast dedicated to the life, work, and ongoing things of Kurt Vonnegut, because he's the best author in the world. My name is Alex Schmidt, and I'm here with my co-host, Michael Swaim. Hi-ho! Hi-ho is right. And so it goes. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. You're, no, thank you for doing it. This is <laughs> yeah. going to be a lot of fun. Oh, we are thrilled. planning on running through all of Kurt Vonnegut's work chronologically. Also, I didn't know there was current Kurt. I th- thought he died, but that's good that he's alive. This he is great to hear. is alive in our hearts. I'm very sorry to let you know that he is, in fact, deceased. Oh, okay. And put okay. You oh, so he is dead. Oh, great way to start the podcast. A uh-huh. second round uh-huh. of feeling like <laughs> <laughs> it happened. Yeah. I actually covered his death. This was to show sincere love in my head, but people didn't read it that way. My satire and paper in college, he passed away when I was in college, and I wrote a op-ed piece called <laughs> Fat Sack of Crap Finally Dies. <laughs> Just like... <laughs> You know, satirically saying the opposite of all my true feelings of love and admiration for Mr. Vonnegut. Yeah. How clearly did people pick up on the the satire? Well, everyone who worked at the paper (laughs) got it, and that's about it. So whatever that percentage of the student body was, my fellow comedians were like, I see what you did there. You like Kurt Vonnegut? Do you? Yeah. (laughs) No one else. Yeah, I mean, today's episode, we're starting, we're going chronologically. We're going to start with Player Piano, which was Kurt Vonnegut's first novel. Uh, Speaking but also, of small audiences, I don't think it make it got out there, did it? it yeah, so it, we can get into the, the publishing history in a bit, but mm. not a hit, not a huge uh, no. uh, success for him. I can kind of see why, too, but also uh, oh. with anything with this, I thought it would be a nice thing to get into, like, hey, Michael, why are us two doing a Kurt Vonnegut podcast? Yeah. What do, when did we find out about him? Why do we like him? Totally. What's our like history with the author? Yeah. And I think people can already tell that we're still feeling out like, or I am like, how much am I allowed to go off on a tangent that's oh, only let's somewhat do related? Let's do yeah, one. yeah. That's what I like in a podcast. It kills a lot of time while I'm <laughs> getting somewhere. So, yeah, but I do think it's hilarious that we're like, we are both the biggest Von heads, as I call them, on staff. <laughs> and we're like, if there's one author we wanted to, do, we're going to tackle this, we're going to really dig into it. And the first five minutes, we've already been like, He's dead, and his first book was a flop. I didn't really like it. <laughs> <laughs> so I do think, as you like, you know, when you see uh, The Lady Killers by the Coen brothers, I, I at least I left and was like, well, it's widely considered their worst movie. You're like, it's still better than 70% of movies. Like, it's still oh, a yeah. Yeah, yeah, Player yeah. Piano is very much that. And I think, yes. uh, I think I'm with you. We talked a little beforehand, and I think we're on the same page of, like, his thesis doesn't totally hold up. No. Or I yeah. or we are the people that he fears because it's a spoiler alert. It's like a 1984 style dystopian novel, right? right. Yeah. And well, I don't want to like hatch that egg before you want to get there, but <laughs> his thesis is something that even in his later works, I feel like he kind of abandons or reverses. So yeah. it feels almost like his attempt to be like, I want to make a name for myself. I've written all these crappy short stories for Playboy. I want to write a novel, a real novel, like you or I might. Or like the guy who saw the scorched, wrote the Scorch Trials, clearly is aware of the Hunger Games, right? Yes. <laughs> like that led into, he didn't wake up in the middle of the night and be like, this beautiful uh. story of children in a maze. <laughs> like it means so much to me. I feel like Kurt was like dystopia, classic sci-fi staple way to go. Yeah. This is just going to be my 1984 Brave New World. Big time. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. it, it really goes through the paces in a classic way of those. One great thing about it is it's how he would do those beats a little bit. Like it's still it's still that it's formula. It's still super you can Vonnegut. See it. Yeah, you yeah. can see him the genius that's coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With Vonnegut personal histories, like I remember starting to work at Cracked, and I had gotten a Sirens of Titan T-shirt for myself, and I was wearing it in like a meeting, and you saw it, and you were like, "I would love to make a movie of that." Yeah, like that's a that's just a thing I would love to be doing because I love Kurt Vonnegut. And yeah, it'd be a great thing. And that means a lot for me because I hate the idea of adapting things in general. <laughs> but I as far as I'm aware, and I'd love to be corrected if I'm wrong, there hasn't been any filmed version of it. I don't think that so. I, and I've looked a little bit. It's my favorite book, hands down. The reason I'm doing this podcast. <laughs> so after what? Episode two? We're going chronologically, right? Yeah, that'll that be the, the second book you wrote. Yeah. Then I'm out. Like, oh, boy. You're going to hear oh, us man. talking about Slaughterhouse Five, and I'm going to be like, 
It was fine. I didn't rain it. I don't really care. <laughs> hey, you remember the Sirens of Titan when they're on Mercury? <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, right. like my favorite all time book. And yeah, I'd love to see it made into a film. I'd love to make it into a film. And when I saw that shirt, I was like, yes. Yeah. Is Vonnegut your favorite? Author? Of I all think time? so. Yeah. yeah. It, it's my first one of his was I was in high school and I was in like this independent study class. And probably the best thing I got out of the class was we had summer reading for it, mm. but it was the good kind of summer reading where they gave us a list of like 30 books and you were just supposed to pick a couple oh and read God. any of them. And I just happened to pick Cat's Cradle. It was on the list and I was nice. just like, okay, I'll just do that. And <laughs> I think I ended up reading like 15 more Vonnegut's within. Yeah. Not that many years. Yeah, but, they're like, compulsive and they're not long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're not long, and it like, and they all because there's so much of him in all of them, they can kind of feel like an extension of each other, even though yeah. they're separate plots and so on. In my life, and I was just yeah, from was, there. It was the first shared universe experience I had too that was so robust. Like it set yeah. the stage for me to appreciate things like Arrested Development, just with the idea of. This is an Easter egg. Like before I even had the concept of an Easter egg, like before DVDs were in my consciousness, <laughs> I was aware that in media you could like, oh, that's funny. That character is just wandering through this scene in a different book. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the things that, man, we got shit. My summer reading was Ishi Last of His Tribe and a Separate Piece by John Knowles. Yeah, that was freshman year, About Separate Piece. some white kid pushing another white kid out of a tree and he breaks his arm. Who gives a shit? Yeah, that I was want like... robots. <laughs> <laughs> I want lasers. God, that was like the start of my high school reading, and I was like, "Is it all going to be about private schools in New England?" Yes, like, oh, it was. Man. Yeah, it was about a snooty private school oh, in New boy. England and their stupid problems. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Illinois. Why are we doing yeah. this? Yeah. So, what got you so firmly? Can you elucidate or have you meditated on what do you think is unique about Vonnegut that like made him one of your enduring favorite authors? There's, a, I mean, there's a few things. I think, well, I, I, one thing I just mentioned, I'm from Illinois, like, I think in one of his things, he calls people from the Midwest, like, freshwater people. I'm like, <laughs> oh, what a wonderful thing. And, like, I just, I, I feel a lot of connection to, like, oh, like, Midwestern guy who went to, like, an upstate New York college mm -hmm. and then, and then went off into, like, trying to write the, like, best, shortest, sharpest things yeah. you could. Or you're uh, very swayed by a simple compliment. Right. Or just you were like, uh, what? flattery. I'm yeah. a freshwater person. <laughs> I love you too, Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Is uh, that good? What does that mean? What does that imply? What's the yeah, connotation he meant it, that you're He fresh meant water? it positively. It's, okay. it's like that they're, right, that, that they're very wet. No, it's yeah. that they're uh, uh, just like good, solid, refreshing people. I see. Yeah. Like if I were to drink you, I'd go, <sighs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm very drinkable. I see. <laughs> um, and yeah, and that it kind of combines science fiction and realistic American fiction and a few other different things yeah. all together and very succinctly in it. And just I hadn't read anybody quite like that who spoke to my brain like that. It's also weird. I think, well, along with that, I think East of Eden by John Steinbeck, that might be also one of my favorite books mm -hmm. right up there with Catch Cray or something else. Mm -hmm. But I think before I had read Vonnegut, my favorite book was probably 1984. Which oh, is, so go. like, it's an odd thing that like, it was probably one of his favorites too. Totally. <laughs> like and he, 1984, he tracks it a bit in Player Piano. Yeah. 1984 was the first book that like roused my emotions to an uncomfortable degree that I wasn't mm. aware. Like it was the first book that made me angry and disturbed and I was upset that I had read it and I was like <laughs> thinking about the government for the first time. <laughs> so yeah, I could see it making a big mark. And yeah, and for me it's also just what I will in retrospect call his Whedon-esque quality is like I love formalism and i just love the english language itself and i love fucking with media so my favorite yeah. comic strips are the ones where they do things that could only happen because it's a comic strip and in no other media like it couldn't be filmed because they yeah. get an effect out of you seeing multiple panels simultaneously because they know you're going to turn the page and blah 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 yeah whatever stuff like that in every media totally gets me off so <laughs> cerebrally so uh <laughs> yeah for me the vonnegut thing is like he demolishes the traditional book form and doesn't care what the yeah. fuck like <laughs> like that i'm totally paraphrasing and i'll quote it correctly when we get to that book and i it might be sirens of titan but they blend together somewhat yeah. but there's like a book where he says like 
at the end of one long chapter, he's like, and everything depended upon, like, is this going to happen or is this going to happen? Who knows? Nobody knows. Will it happen? And then you turn the page and chapter 28 is just the words, it did. And then you turn the page <laughs> and it's the next chapter. So just stuff like that. In Breakfast of Champions, he famously, like, inserts himself in the book and is like, also, Kurt Vonnegut was there. His dick was nine miles long. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's amazing to me, and it breaks the form in a way that's Brechtian. For those who don't have the privilege of, like, a snooty drama education, Brechtian meaning, like, drawing attention meta, like we say meta now. Intentionally not taking you out of the thing because the actor sucked at that moment, but taking you out of the thing to be, like, Filmmaking is also interesting. Look at how this was edited. Right. Pay attention to that, and that means something. So he's not afraid to do that, and he's just so goddamn witty, a master of in the way that Twain was, and I think Whedon is in film. Yes. The one-liner that is, so where Whedon's, Whedon might be in the universe of like playing off of coolness, like he wants you to hear that line and go, God, that guy's so cool, or that girl's so badass, they're going to destroy. But Vonnegut <laughs> will have a one sentence that makes you go like, that's the greatest insight I've ever heard in my <laughs> life. And he just nails it. That to me is like the quintessential Vonnegut nugget. Yeah. is like wisdom, dropping science in like a short, darkly funny sentence. Sure. And, uh, and there's a lot of those in Player Piano, actually. My girlfriend Jen and I just saw Titus Andronicus, Shakespeare's famously worst play. Right. And it was really, really problematic and upsetting. <laughs> but I won't get into why. That's too much. That's tangents on tangents. No. But similarly, there's still good Shakespeare shit in there, right? There's still amazing lines. Yes. And like in this, is it too early to segue into the guts of player piano? No, let's get into it. And, okay. also, well, and also, I was just going to say, I, I can't believe I didn't, in my things of why I like Vonnegut, mention how funny he is. Because he, like, he's, of course. And, yeah. and there's like, I feel like there's this through line from Mark Twain to Kurt Vonnegut on to other people, especially George Saunders, that like, it's just like everybody on that tree. I'm like, these are, these are my people. This is great. But yeah, into, into the guts of it. And also, this is a show, folks, where, you know, a lot of podcasts have segments and things like that. We're just going to go ahead and say we're in a segment when we're in a segment because it's fun and, and that's how life is. Okay, we're on some kind of psychic level connection shit right now because I was about to try and start the first segment. First segment. Kurt Blurt. That's what I'm calling it, Kurt Blurt. Kurt Blurt. I, I don't know if I ran that by you. Yeah, you this did. Is a pro great. Okay, I'm proposing a segment. This will be the first and possibly last iteration of it called Kurt Blurt. Segment accepted. Great. And that could be Kurt with a C or Kurt with a K. That's what's great about audio because obviously it's something Kurt blurted, <laughs> in his mind at least, before he <laughs> typed it. But furthermore, I think as we're talking about, one of his trademarks is the Kurt saying the sort of like succinct right. boom gotcha so a couple kurt blurts and i think this is more than anything to get people to be like oh i do want to read this book because so far we've just been like it's like an okay 1984 knockoff. yeah well and also probably uh toward the top of it we should say that this may spoil aspects of the book for you if you haven't oh, read it yet yeah also consider I've, this a book club yeah. like you should have read the book or not care Exactly. Yeah. And I and and <laughs> because this book I could see you either having read and wanting to tune in, or you're like, I love Kervonica, but maybe I'm not gonna dive that deep into it and just make this my yeah. experience play. You'll get piano. a you'll get a nice schmear of player piano. Let's do Kurt Blurt and then we'll talk about the thesis of the book. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Kurt maybe. Blurt, or like they, the setup hand of hand. the book. Yeah. But I got two Kurt Blurts just to whet your appetite. Right. There's a checker playing robot called Checker Charlie. <laughs> yes. And the book is I'll have to at least tip the thesis a little. It's about the horrors of automation. Because yes. God forbid if a computer could ever play checkers. Right. How cheap human life has become. <laughs> so Right. Like yeah. where nineteen eighty four is terrified of totalitarian government, this is terrified of automation. And like what if you're the guy who's really good at checkers and then there's just some fucking computer? It's better that check uh, you at checkers? Right. It's in dehumanizing. Our, <laughs> in our in our era of more tabletop gaming than ever before, <laughs> exactly. you've chosen checkers as your calling. Yeah. So uh, our hero, in quotes, Dr. Paul Proteus, is constantly winning at checkers. So someone to, like, prank him creates a robot to beat him at checkers. And I think it's a testament to Vonnegut's writing that it really got me. Like, I was humiliated and I felt his shame and I was really upset on his behalf. Yeah. When the, this smug idiot who would yeah. never beat him at checkers is like, I'll bet you a thousand dollars and then wheels out this machine and you're like, oh, I see what's going to happen. You're going to humiliate me in front of a bunch of people by showing that even I, 
right. can be automated and it's all bullshit. Also, and he tries all of his to, friends are on board with the robot. Yes, all of his friends are like, like, yeah, get him. Let's watch this. This is going to be an <laughs> amazing novelty. Yeah. Well, anyway, he wins just because the robot breaks down because it was built poorly. Yeah. <laughs> like It has a loose connection. And the guy who challenged him, whose dad spent many years of his life working on this checkers playing robot, because that's what you do in Kurt Vonnegut land, because they didn't invent Call of Duty, says, you know, why, God? Why? Why did this have to happen? It's like Cameron and Ferris Bueller. <laughs> like, he's really petrified about how his dad's going to react. Why did this have to happen? And uh, the Kurt blurt is... It was one more hollow echo of the question humanity had been asking for millenniums, the question men were born to ask. <laughs> and I like that oh, one. Yeah. And then uh, skipping way ahead to the end, but it, without spoiling anything, there's another one that needs much less setup. Sort of the subversive character, Ed Finnerty, is talking about like, basically the idea of just one day saying fuck it and like bucking the system. Like if you decided today's the day I no longer abide by law or like <laughs> the American government or wherever you live. There was enchantment in what Finnerty had done. A thing almost as inconceivable and beautifully simple as suicide. Ooh. Not, I don't endorse like the yeah. message. No, I'm, I'm okay. But what the, a, oh, right? nicely done. Such insight. Yeah. And what a good Kurtism. That's like, Okay, maybe this is too personal of a window to have opened up, but everyone has, I think. it's a, At the times in my life, I've contemplated suicide, seriously. Uh -huh. Not frequent or recent. But, right. um, okay, good. Yeah. But I don't know, that just strikes so to that moment. Inconceivable and beautifully simple. Like, inconceivable is the... Inconceivable is the word <laughs> that I think elevated that sentence to like, mm, that's beautiful. Yeah. Just because just like the... Embracing death to get out of situation is at the same time such an easy out that is the most difficult decision you could ever theoretically make at the you know in your life, right? Or like the most life altering decision. That's uh, getting back to one of the yeah. the great things about this. Like we were saying, like it's a lot in a lot of ways templated after a 1984 or a Brave New World. Or there's a, a novel called Darkness at Noon that uh, I don't know that one. That Kervanga. It's about um life in the USSR and essentially just. Someone's living there, and then suddenly it's this horrible communist place. But it was that was another novel that he, according to his letters and things, was reading at the time. I was saying like, oh, I could if I could do something. Was like it that, like a right? historical though? Like I it was don't remember. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I like. Did it have lasers and robots, or was it depicting what it was like to live in Russia as the communist rose? If you weren't on that side, I believe it was actually realistic. Like it was right. actually kind of how things were yeah. and either a fictionalized account because dystopias or a real have existed on earth so it was like yeah. a story of one of those real ones yeah yeah and i think boring he... <laughs> <laughs> the the novel is template of a lot of those things but then things that kurt does in a lot of his work like thinking about suicide is a major thing because yes. that comes up in a lot of his books oh, and he's life, dark and bitter and so uh, funny at the same time and that's what's amazing yeah and one of the best things about this book is that it's still vonnegut even though yeah it, is not that, but then also like talking about finding a Kurt Blurt type thing in it. Mm -hmm. Like so many of the famous ones are, hi ho, so it goes, and like things like that. And this is this the, book. I the would first say, instance of hi ho, I believe, first recorded hi ho, which is in this book, and it'll come up in almost every book he writes. Someone says hi ho. Oh. I've never figured out why or what that what the hell that's supposed to mean. It comes up. I forgot it comes up in this one. He someone says it one time. I okay. don't remember when or the context. But, they don't make but a thing I out of made it. a big note of it. No. Yeah. Just like someone's like like Anita's like I don't love you and I never have and he's like hi ho, <laughs> <laughs> something like that, something like that. Well, you know, uh, Anita is his problematic, frigid, manipulative, shallow, soft-headed wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll get into that a little later, probably. Yeah. <laughs> I have problems it, with her portrayal. <laughs> yeah, me too. Well, I was going to say that this, yeah. I would say this book is a lot wordier than he usually is. Like it's, it's denser and it's less more literate. Tight and it's, yeah. yeah. And it's a little bit more of a conventional book and yes. how things are phrased and how the action happens than. But then in the like excess packing material, if you dig it away, all the bones are still really yeah. solid Kurt Vonnegut lines. But yeah, I think he just hasn't embraced his voice yet fully. You see him yes. trying to be a little more conventional. But there's great seeds of Vonnegut stuff, like the military guy, instead of saying forward march, saying forward harch. And <laughs> there's like many of those. And I'm just thinking of the chapter in Sirens of Titan called Cheers in the Wirehouse, which is supposed to be a guy saying chairs in the warehouse. <laughs> and... <laughs> 
Kurt Vonnegut just super loves writing in dialect, which is another trademark of the Coen brothers, my other like favorite artist soulmate people, just super obsessed with writing in the way a unique group of people sounds when they talk. Yeah. And I just love that. It, or it makes me think of young Kurt serving in the military, listening to a guy go like, what, hurt? And like writing down like, F word Barch, Ford Hart, Ford Harch. That's what it sounds like. Sounds like Ford Harch. That's really cool to me. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very, a very real life thing. We, uh, I feel like we can get into a little bit of outlining the book in this segment called 1984. <laughs> Is that a golf four? Yeah. Like, yeah, get out it's of the like, way. Here comes it's dystopia. Like, uh, oh, I missed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah, I feel like with this book in particular, we kind of touched on it before, but does he execute a dystopian novel with the plot he lays out? You know? Oh, I see. We're done meandering. This is the part of the book report where the teacher's like, Mr. Schmidt, please get to the point. <laughs> there are other students to get through. <laughs> the teacher and the student are the worst. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I feel like it's a good way to... The, the, general, the general plot of the book, if you haven't read it or if you're uh, trying to re-remember it from way back when, yeah. is, is the story of a, a scientist named Paul Proteus. Dr. Paul Proteus. Dr. Paul Proteus, I just you. I only the interrupt insufferably because it's super important point, I think, is... Everyone in the society is a doctor of whatever they do, unless they're one of the poor people, and then they're not. Yeah. Like, to a ridiculous degree. Like, he goes to see whatever, his accountant, and he's like, good afternoon, doctor, and to you, doctor. <laughs> and I think that kind of has come true. That satire, he at home for me. Yeah, and that's a situation where Paul Proteus is a high-ranking person at the Ilium Works in the fictional city of Ilium, New York, which is uh, pretty clearly patterned after Schenectady, New York, in real life. Easier uh, to say. And I think I said it right. <laughs> and then the, the company is also probably patterned after uh, General Electric's uh, set up in Schenectady, New York. But anyway, uh, it's a society where machines kind of determine everything. I shouldn't say kind of, they do. You take tests and your abilities are run through a computer and it tells you either your job is to be this very high level doctor, engineer person running the machines, or you're someone who's essentially on like a WPA construction crew, yeah. like just like wandering around fixing roads and stuff. It occurred to me, it's essentially the pilot of Futurama. <laughs> like it's just the career chip is the plot. I mean, it's more than that because it's automation in every <laughs> sense of the word, like their whole lives are automated. But the yeah. central conceit is, wouldn't it suck if a computer chose your job for you? Yeah. Or took away your job, because that's the other big thing that's happening, right, is there's this huge pool of disaffected citizens who live across the river and yeah. are, like, quietly seething away in their horrible lives because all their jobs are now done by robots. Yeah. And what Kurt sort of puts forward is if you automate all the factory jobs, because they're nice to them, or, like, they give them free government subsistence right so it's not like like they live yeah. well or that's the point that the oppressors try to make but there's a dignity of working of like going to the factory and working at the lathe every day that they somehow the spirit has gone out of these people and they're living these drab horrible lives and we can get back to just like getting through the plot also but come off it i don't know if <laughs> the factory worker working the lathe is like this is the part of my life that imbues it with quiet human dignity is right. working at this lathe eight hours a day. <laughs> like he really like they straight up tell a story where Paul Proteus is super pleased because he invented a technology that basically is like mocapping, which is a great sci-fi mm -hmm. foresight. They yeah. mocap a guy who's really good at turning the lathe and building this chair leg or whatever. Right. And then they're like, now we make a robot that just perfectly mimics his motions so now that robot makes all the lathe legs. You're all fired. And yeah. they're all like, what will we do without our lathe making job? You've taken away the thing that made us human. And I, and I just don't agree <laughs> that that's what made them human. I don't know if it's just like we're in a, a tough time in the country or something. But like I, it is hard to sell a dystopia where in this book everyone ha is fed and everyone has a house. And everyone right. – like but there's the idea no that property. automation yeah. does your job is what's sad or what we're right. supposed to be upset the about. The thing that's been taken away is that early in the book they – and it, it's like really laying out exactly what it's about very early yeah. where they talk about like, oh, the first industrial revolution was the one that happened that where know. like we got factories. <laughs> and then the second industrial revolution is robots replaced 
just like routine work done by humans. Yeah. And they talk about like what happens when the third industrial revolution replaces being a smart person, essentially, yeah. or like a or like a white collar, high level like manager of things. Yeah, and I he has a quote that's supposed to like be one of the doom moments. Yeah. And keep in mind, okay, so like Brave New World is about the question of first of all, there are losers in those societies. Like in Brave New World, there are thoroughly oppressed groups of society who are yeah. suffering horribly. Right. And it's about the idea of if you could take a drug every day that just makes you happy regardless of whether your house is going to shit or not. And that's very interesting to me. Are you living a happy life or are you living a lie that's just a weird drug addiction? Right. That's Brave New World. And then 1984 is explicitly like everyone except the ruling class think they're doing all right because of propaganda, but they're actually living like poverty stricken. Right. Like all they drink is cheap gin and go to their shitty jobs and eat a piece of bread. Yeah. In Player Piano, the stakes seem so much lower because everyone is explicitly doing fine. It's funny because Vonnegut has this mix of optimism that most sci-fi writers have and intense pessimism about progress right. where he's like, he envisions machines doing a great job so everyone does have enough to eat and a lot of great shows on tv to watch and like can <laughs> learn whatever they want from the automo book or school or whatever they yeah. don't go into full detail but it seems like their only real gripe is that there's nothing for them to do like they're bored yeah if you're living in a thing where that you think is a utopia as the people in charge try to assert yet the place where you work, the Ilium Works, is guarded by an inner gate, an outer gate, and multiple armed guards in a cement bunker with a little slit in it. Yeah. How do you not know you're actually in a dystopia? Yeah. It's so clear. <laughs> and they also say that the, the laws of the country have been changed. So if you're a saboteur, if you're a person who's breaking these machines, yeah. that's like the worst crime you can commit. I love commit. that. It's like the ultimate <laughs> is... opposite of Asimov. Where, oh, at least the robot's main rule is don't fuck with humans. But we are, in this, the yeah. law is humans can't break a robot. That's the ultimate crime. And from there, it, uh, the book kind of unspools a thing of, is Paul going to decide that this dystopia that he's sitting behind all the fences of, is, it, yeah. is he going to decide to buck the trend of it? Or is he going to be like his father before him who helped build this and like continue to run it and manage it and rise up in it? And at the same time, will he be okay with his relationship with his like implausibly Lady Macbethy almost wife? And, yeah. uh, Remind, have you seen A Simple Plan? Uh, no. Really, really good movie. I'm also just going to shoehorn it as many recommendations. As I can. <laughs> Simple Do Plan, it, yeah. great Sam Raimi movie. Under scene, I would say. But yeah, it really reminded me. There's a scene where the wife, basically these guys find a million dollars in the woods and they just decide not to return it. They don't know anything about it. But slowly yeah. but surely they turn on each other until they're all dead and no one got the money. <laughs> you know, it's like that kind of story. And the guy you're supposed to hope might at the last second do the right thing or get out of the situation has this horrible wife that is like straight out of player piano. I mean, it's Anita. <laughs> it was amazing. Because <laughs> in Player Piano, there's this scene where Paul's the character that we're with where we can't decide, is it good that society's like this or is it bad? And of course, like in all these books, secretly there's a revolution brewing. And is he going to join the revolution? Is he going to stick with the imperialists? Or is he going to just be torn up in the middle? That's sort of the question of the book. And yeah. his wife, just like in a simple plan, is super pro oppressors <laughs> and manipulative <laughs> and like heartbreakingly so you know he loves oh, her and man. wants her to be enlightened with him or his yeah. version of what he wants her to believe so like the great symbol of that is in like the halfway mark of the book he buys a farm right and yeah. it's a farm that explicitly has laws on it for boring reasons that don't matter where it can't be automated it's like a national curiosity of the state like yeah it's like yeah. somebody's will and it's historically marked and like right. and so on and so forth and he thinks that this will get her he, yeah. he's still in the middle of the book he's not going to join the revolution and like die but he might just run away from here and take his wife to a farm and just live on a farm <laughs> and i love that first of all he takes her there on what he wants to be a very impressive romantic date yeah they drink heavily they pre-party before they go there yeah they're driven there, which, by the way, I don't know why Kurt Vonnegut could imagine everything being automated, but there are still barbers and drivers. Automatic cars yeah. are not possible in his mind. Well, it's even like... Nor it is even a haircutting a, machine. <laughs> it even makes it a little less dystopian because the barber's like, yeah, people thought it was too weird if it was a robot, so I do it still. It's like, oh, yeah. okay, then I guess things are a little better, though. Oh, yeah. Either. But then there's the <laughs> negative example of that when they're all having dinner right before the Checkers Charlie debacle 
when is the only I believe the only minority outside the Shah and his entourage in the book. Yeah. Dinner is served, said a Filipino waiter. Many had talked about replacing the waiters with robots, but this was always voted down in a landslide. <laughs> I'm like, I love like, the implication ugh. is that no, no, no. I still want to feel superior to a fellow race of humans when I eat my bullshit. Right. <laughs> you can automate everything else, but that little feeling of exclusivity, let's keep that. But yeah, what was I talking about? Oh, so he's trying to impress his wife and get her to move to a farm. They pre-party yeah. before they get there, and their romantic dinner includes two glasses of whole milk fresh from the cow's udder and mm. a bottle of gin. <laughs> milk and gin. Oh, yeah. So anyway, she's Perfect terrible. Night. So they know. <laughs> so they go to bed that night, and he basically spills her gut, his guts, right, and tells her the truth, which is that he's disillusioned. He wants to drop out of this bullshit society. Yeah, and well, and she like kind of refuses to accept it and keeps pushing yeah. him to to stay in it. And then, uh, and then he keeps getting pushed by the company to be higher and higher in society. And then at the same time, keeps kind of trying to avoid it. He knows a guy who's like very careerist and trying to replace him, and he's kind of like. Uh, great go ahead Shepherd. but also can't do that yeah, yeah lost and shepherd and then it builds and builds to a climax of uh him deciding kind of to revolt but then also it getting turned on him by the people above him who yes. are like great what a cover a revolt very funny and very i good super want to heavily get into that but in the interest of somewhat keeping it chronological yeah. i just want to unpack the farm thing a little bit before oh, sure. yeah, yeah. so they go to bed that night right and she has that thing where she whispers in his ear, just like Lady Macbeth or just like simple plan lady. I'm like, who's going to win? Blue team, by God. Blue team's going to win. Which is very much, I think, in this book, Vonnegut's version of And He Loved Big Brother. It's oh, the sure. moment where, yeah. I mean, Paul ends up going back and forth and back and forth and back again. But it's one of the moments where he's like, I give up. I'll join the shitty society. Yeah. And it's worse than her just not wanting to live there. She wants to automate the farmhouse. Remember? The reason he's disappointed is he takes her to live in this farmhouse and she's like, I love it. And right. you really think the book might turn into, oh, it's going to be us, them against the world. Like he's going to flip her. Yeah. And she's like, I love it. We can replace that with an automatic blah, blah, blah. We can insert the <laughs> automatic thing over there. And he's like, oh, right. my heart is broken. So maybe we should get into how he's courted by Ed Finnerty and the ghost shirt. Yeah. Folks, right. So talk a little bit so about the revolution. There's like a revolutionary group against this company and, and the way society works called the Ghost Shirt Society. It's named after the Ghost Dancers, uh, which were a Native American movement against sort of the destruction of Native American culture. And it's also there's an interesting thing where uh, in Kurt's life, as he was doing this novel, he was working on getting his um, master's degree at the University of Chicago in cultural anthropology. And he submitted a thesis where he was going to, or at least his original thesis was going to be about the ghost dancers. It was going to be about that actual movement. And his thesis idea was rejected completely. But in doing all that research, it influenced that being a part of the book. Yeah. And that's another thing I love about this is I don't know any of the real life stuff. And it turns out all these books, no matter how imaginative, are like super autobiographical. Yeah. So the the way this company is sort of super smarmy and into like the nobility of the corporate culture seems like straight up he hated working at GE or he yeah. at least observed this train of thought that he thought was destructive and then exaggerated it for effect. But when he, when his wife's saying who's going to win, he's saying blue team, blue team by God, it's because against his will, he's been made the leader of the blue team at this yearly, basically team building retreat. Yeah. That, can you talk about that? Like there was a real GE equivalent. In the book, it's called uh, the, the Meadows, Meadows after the location where they have four color coded teams of like the high rising people in this fictional version of GE. They like do this team building thing there with a lot of just running around all day doing physical activities and networking and like cocktails at night. And that's how you prove you're like a person in the company. And there are even like team songs for it. All those elements are in a, an exact thing called Camp GE that people in General Electric did yeah. and that people who worked with Kurt's brother, Bernard, who also worked at General Electric and was older and, and a scientist there, and like people who worked with him also seating? went there. Yeah. So he, he was on a team. There's this book called The Brothers Vonnegut by Ginger Strand that gets into Kurt Vonnegut and his brother and their overall experience at GE and all those different things. And it's like beat for beat. He even like got out of his day job at GE to write this novel basically about GE. Like it mm -hmm. really guided the whole thing. And his brother was part of a team with a scientist named Irving Langmuir, 
who uh, was one of, I think, the first or one of the first in like industrial scientists to win a Nobel Prize. And then uh, another guy named Vincent Schaefer, I think it was. But the three of them were working on cloud seeding. And then Kurt's brother, Bernard, came up with silver iodide as the chemical you use to do it. So to make it of, rain, essentially. Yeah, because they started using... the phrase. Yeah, it's how we artificially can make it rain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they because they started using dry ice, and it did fine, but it kind of wore off. And then Bernard found out that silver iodide makes the effect last, and you can create, like, floods and like crazy <laughs> just crazy weather phenomena for long periods Bizarre. of time yeah. i don't even know because i heard about that 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 we have that technology to make clouds rain yeah do we do that Is, are people out there doing that regularly i'm not aware of like i never give a buzz on my phone that's like hey it's gonna rain over your area because we're seeding the clouds because you need water <laughs> well it, it was a thing that as soon as they were coming up with it they realized like Oh, someone should regulate this because oh my like, God, what are we? And that might, that's can, partially the inspiration for Ice Nine and Cat's Cradle, right? Yeah. Well, so also, Player Piano was Kurt's first novel, but it was not his first attempt. And his first attempt like, was not to the do, first outline he thought of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And his first attempt was based on conversations with GE scientists who said, like, "Hey, if you like restructured ice the way ice works, you would have this whole different composition." And so he came up with Ice Nine. And mm -hmm. was like, why don't I write a novel around Ice Nine? And Dope. he kept outlining it, and he kept trying, and it kept not working. And then after he wrote a couple novels, and ten years went by, he finally turned it into Cat's Cradle. Nice. But his first idea was, oh, these GE people have inspired me to do. So it's obviously autobiographical, player piano. I mean, yeah. more so than the rest. And I wonder, did you have anyone in there that you thought was the Vonnegut surrogate? Meaning, like yeah. just saying the things. At some different points, I thought it could be Finnerty who's the guy who sort of comes into the story already ready, eager to join the revolutionaries, but who came from Paul's background. Or it could be Lasher, who's the reverend who grew up in sort of the subjugated part of town. So he's like yes. the leader of the revolt who's of those people. So I think I think he's spread throughout the book. Or his and, brain could be split up, yeah. Well, because this is a, a great time for a segment called... <gasps> Kurt Cameo! Kurt Mio! Because <laughs> <laughs> obviously, if you read Locker Vine, you know many of his books, he just writes Kurt Vonnegut into it. He actually shows up. Mm -hmm. Or Kilgore Trout is the person who's yeah. him, or something like that. This one, I think a few elements of him are spread out throughout it. Lasher is definitely one of them, especially because he, he goes around saying, like, oh, I'm a priest, but also I'm interested in how cultures work, and so on and so forth. And that, that kind of fits with a lot of Kurt's interests and so on. There's also a thing in Kurt's real life where when he got hired to work in the PR office at GE through his brother, the scientist, kind of helping him get the gig, he didn't have a college degree yet. He had left Cornell to go fight in the war, and then he hadn't gotten his thesis yet at U of Chicago, so he didn't actually have a degree. And um, when we're talking about the outline of this book, there's the main story following Paul, but there's also a sort of B story, I guess. They're constantly following a fictional oh, yeah. leader of a country we called Bratpur, like the Shah that. of Bratpur. And he's visiting the United States to see what it's like, and you kind of see how their society works through him. And the guy leading him around is a guy named Ewing Halyard, who later in the book you find out he is going to lose his whole life because he didn't pass one gym class in college which he needed the degree to get his doctorate, and then from yeah. there his whole life. And so if he doesn't go back to college and pass a gym class, he loses everything. It's like Brazil, like that terror yeah. of... It's a different side of the coin, I think, of the horrors of automation, where it's like... Or even the trial, you know? It's like, oh, this one clerical error destroys your life, and because the system's so bureaucratic and cold, no one cares and no one's going to help you. Yeah, But, like, yeah. we forgot a space... We forgot to hit the space bar 20 years ago, so you're fired. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's his situation. It is such a... Didn't you think, though, kind of a tangentially related plot? Like, it barely touches on the A plot at all. Yeah. It's well, interesting. It... It's just kind of a way for the Shah yeah. of Bratpur to represent, here's what someone from outside the society might think of it. Yeah, it's sort of <laughs> when Kurt signed up for the job at GE, they hired him on the condition of him finishing his thesis. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll finish it. But he didn't for a long time. Like He, I, he I was think shooting he... back to school instead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so he, throughout his time at his job, he just knew, like, if anybody finds out I don't have that degree, they'll, they'll, they're just going to summarily fire uh, me. <laughs> and my wife and child won't have food. And <laughs> what do See, I do? See, so that's what I mean. Like, I feel like it's less defensible to have that B-plot in there. But he was like emotionally invested in Halyard's story because yeah, yeah. it was autobiographical. Yeah. Which is funny because I don't think Halyard's even that sympathetic. Or I 
Did no, you like really. him? No, not in particular. He totally is just like a representative of someone who totally buys the societal rules they were raised in and is going to go along with it, right? Like, yeah, and then just gets squished by him at the end. And gets destroyed and, by the revolution. Well, and right? also in the original drafts of the novel, the way it ends and uh, how it came out, it ends with Paul, but in the original drafts of the novel, there was an extra final, final chapter with Halyard and the Shah, and so it sort of landed on them more, and it sort of, but yeah. they got rid of that, but didn't get rid of the whole thing. And so it sort of feels like it's just kind of there, yeah. And then also the one the one other autobiographical thing is there's a weird part in that Shah Halyard thing where they pick up the Shah of prostitutes in out town. Super field. By really the way, the, on, the only female character other than the evil wife is a prostitute. Yeah, and like <laughs> and like kind of a dopey secretary. Yeah. Like just oh kinda yeah, I forgot Catherine. Out. Oh yeah. One of my favorite lines also. <laughs> and I'll save this for a little segment because I got a lot of ammunition for a segment you know we're gonna get to. But oh, yeah. uh, I'll throw one out right off the bat is the line uh Catherine began to cry then, so he slipped into his office and shut the door. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Classic nineteen forties response. <laughs> uh, broads. Whoop. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna uh okay, hold my calls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and with the so with the prostitute, it's really jarring at all that they're doing it. But then yeah. she gets in the limo and ha that the, they're driving the shot around in, and Halyard's like, you know, he like wants to use you as a prostitute, right? And the lady's like, yeah, I know. This is what happened in my life. My husband tried to write a novel, and the novel didn't pass like the computer system His for what a good novel uh, is. Vert Conabit, right? <laughs> <laughs> and she and she's like, yeah. And the computer said his novel wasn't quite good enough, so now we have no food or anything, and I need to feed our family somehow. So it's like this really weird, bizarre moment where Kurt writes in his terror about the failure of his novel in his novel, yeah, in a novel that also kind of ended up failing. <laughs> and here's my question for you, dead Kurt. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, okay, bear with me. So one of the things I found hard to believe or that made me think that the evil society in this dystopian novel is kind of a straw man argument. Yeah. First of all, we'll get to it, but the point of his very famous short story, Harrison Bergeron, is the opposite of this. But <laughs> anyway, that aside, if you're just taking this world on its own merits, they've put these machines and we're talking about what Vonnegut writing in the 30s? Or 40s. He wrote this in, uh, in mostly in 1951, this book. Halfway <laughs> out. No, it's okay. So that's why you're here, for the ground. <laughs> okay, so this is the 50s idea of the horror that computers could one day become. Yeah. So what's funny to me is it has Jetson syndrome. Like, this computer that's all powerful, A, in his imagination in this book, it's still the size of like six buildings. Right. Unnecessarily. It still runs on punch cards and vacuum tubes. Yeah. It just it just processes like a billion punch cards a minute or something. <laughs> and what's more, it can do some things, you know, as sci-fis want to be. This amazing hypothetical computer can do lots of things our computers still can't do, but it can't do very simple things that our computers can easily do now. Right. So it's a total crapshoot of like what this guy in the 50s thought computers might end up being like. And all, and also this is, a, this is a good spot for a very tiny recurring character segment. Recurring yeah. characters, because uh, yeah, that's, which character? It's kind of sneaky, but the, the big big super uber computer that they just take oh, a, a chapter with, Epicac, is in also another short story and oh, a few other spots. I didn't know. And so that's it's sort of a sneaky one because it's a computer. Do you think <laughs> it was meant to sound like Epicac, the solution you take to induce vomiting? I think almost definitely, yeah. Okay, because yeah, because it, and it's sort of it's also it sort of a parody of ENIAC for yes. you people who love punny versions of of mainframe names. Exactly, <laughs> but I do think. Uh, oh, do you know the HAL IBM thing? Is that um? So oh, it's a letter off, right? So in 2001, a space odyssey. The computer is called HAL because it's one letter off of I B M. Yeah. Know? So yeah. it's supposed to just be an IBM. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's the one that fucks up and kills everyone. Not a Mac. <laughs> but so I would just say at Kurt, <laughs> I find it hard to believe that a society would have a computer that clearly the computers, because he explicitly says they don't understand things like randomness or like what the Japanese call wabi-sabi, <laughs> like the beauty of asymmetry, <laughs> the value of creativity, yeah. like the, the power of random mutations, either literally in DNA or like in ideas to make a bunch of garbage, but also sometimes create something amazing that wouldn't have existed otherwise. So like diversity and variety and chaos, we all know, I feel like, is a strength. Yeah. I mean, we live in a country of immigration historically, and I think that's part of that belief is like 
get a lot of ideas in the mix. Anyway, I just find it hard to believe that the society would turn everything over to machines before they were ready. And here's my counterexample. If the machine was right, like if that machine read his book, the character that had the failed novel, and yeah. was like, this won't sell. The machine's either right or wrong, right? Yeah. And if it's wrong, then I find it hard to believe that we ever would have gotten in this position. Because if there's a book that would have sold a million copies, but it didn't get published because a machine said no, people who yeah. could have made money on that book will be really pissed off. And it would like, I feel like that system wouldn't develop just because yeah. the money incentive. And then on the other hand, if the machine's right, then all it did was save the author time the time and pain of releasing their book, seeing it make no money and bomb, and then still being in the same position where your wife is prostituting herself to the Shah right. because you're broke. <laughs> so I guess all I'm saying is like, hail our glorious robot leaders. I don't, I I don't see welcome. the problem. Yeah. Well, it, and also, I think it, he picked a wrong problem <laughs> for what, his dystopia. And that question you asked before about like, is this a dystopia or is this like already kind of happening to us and so on? Oh like, yeah, and a lot of it. That's what's more impressive is not the stuff he predicted would go wrong in horrible dark ways hasn't, but a bunch of the stuff he just predicted would be true is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like there's one bit where uh, they talk about like I think the, the, he's seeing a doctor or something, and it's like yeah, robots handle a lot of this now. Like that's that's happening. Yeah. Like people are working on a robot that knocks out the paperwork and the initial checking in on a patient for their temperature and so on and things like that. Yeah, They're, that's that we're working on that right now. And even with like creative work. Like you read things about, oh, Netflix looked at their algorithm and that was a guidepost they used to develop House of Cards. They were yeah. like, yeah, people like Kevin Spacey and people like political dramas and so on. That. That's very good to know. Yeah. Humans go write it, but like we'll use yeah. the, the aid of robots to help us with this kind of thing. Man, there's an amazing comic book called Scud the Disposable Assassin. I've heard Rob of it. Schraub. I haven't read it. One of the issues is about a futuristic alien society where the countries only battle like in war by whoever can bankrupt the other side by sending the best, most kick-ass AAA action movies that <laughs> everyone goes to and, like, spends all their money on until your society's <laughs> bankrupt. So they have these advanced computers that just spend their time calculating, like, nine explosions per minute is the optimal number of explosions. <laughs> it's, it's really cool. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yeah, and I guess... I wouldn't have a problem with that is what I'm learning about myself. <laughs> when we even like just calculating what we need in general, like companies like Amazon kind of do that. Yeah. Like, Cause that's they, the other big of point of the book like, is Epicac is constantly saying only make 18,408 microwaves. That's how many you'll need. Yeah. No reason to denude nature by taking more resources. That's how many people will buy this year. Yeah. And the, that sounds great. And, and we're doing that. <laughs> right. And the book says, like, that's the main reason their society has enough food and everything is right. that they've had computers figure out how to not how waste to conserve resources. the food. Yeah. So it's like, OK, great. <laughs> that sounds great. But then everyone's sort of just and trust me, I think it's interesting. We're kind of get it bearing on like a political issue, which is I get the counter side in real life, which is I'm only trained to do this job. Automation took it away. No one's giving me. Right any training or money in recompense, the rest of my life is going to be a spiral down into poverty. And that freaking sucks. Yeah, and we yeah, should yeah. do more to help people who are put out of a job. But I guess yes. I just can't agree with the idea that you have to like freeze it or somehow retard the progress because I truly believe that there are amazing, noble things to do in life. Like if you were born into a future civilization where you didn't ever have to worry about food or anything yeah. like that, or finding housing or anything. I don't want my job dictated to me. But I mean, let's say you had no job because you lived in a in like Starfleet Academy. Yeah, technological and they replicated. unemployment. Yeah. I'm sort of on the Gene Roddenberry side where I feel like, of course, there would still be crazy murderers and assholes, a percentage. But if we lived in a resource-free society, I don't think people would just become like filled with malaise and shitty and just like mill around doing nothing living in a haunted horrified state i think right. we would like everyone would be super into like art philosophy like just hanging out and talking with your family <laughs> like there's yeah. lots of good stuff to do with your life you don't have to work the reason right. to work is it is to earn your keep right but i'm just saying if in theory no one's being oppressed yeah. by you just chilling 
chilling is fun. I don't see why everyone, everyone <laughs> with the problem is with that. Well, and also, and then, and maybe one of the successfully predictive things about the book is that at the end of the book, everyone is like, oh, bring back the machine. Like, I loved machines. Let's just get that going again. Yes. And we should get to the end. Yeah. Okay. So two things. I'm sure you notice like multiple people when he's driving around say, hey, your headlight's broken. Yeah. And I think it finally clicked for me that I think it's supposed to be like just hammering home that he's the character who sees both sides and isn't sure which way he's going to go. Yeah. Like Finnerty has the vision. The true vision of what is going down right now in society, he sees through the bullshit. Right. But Paul's like, well, I see one eye's open, one eye's closed, sort of because I want it to be, because I'm yeah. not ready to risk it all. And then people like uh, his superiors, like Croner and Bear and so on, just like love it. They're on the yes. opposite of Finnerty. Right. They're like, no, this is the best. And Let's never change it. And I love that he also slips in, he sort of slips in someone who represents every sort of response. Like Luke Lubbock is this rando character who they see who is a member of like, the equivalent of like the Masons and yeah. the Moose Lodge. But then later you see he's also a member of the Secret Rebellion. Yeah. Then at the Meadows, when they're doing the stupid GE propaganda chant, they mention that he's there just because he's on the wait staff, but he has like his hand to his heart and is crying and openly like <laughs> cheering along to all the propaganda. The point being that there are people who just like joining organizations <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i love he's a minor character and they are a minority in society but i love that he presented like there's also people who are going to join whatever revolution is going on like the yeah. luke lubbock's who are just moved by anything that pretends to be noble and also just like love... they're going to fall for anything whoever talked to them most recently yeah and they, and they also just love being in groups like it's almost kind of a predictor yeah. of gra uh, the grand falloon concept of like oh a yes. group has power just mentally for us because yeah. we're part of a thing and that's very exciting so Vonnegut, i think we're going to hit on this probably throughout the whole podcast <laughs> he has that famous quote i think it's from other night but i'm not sure uh we become what we pretend to be so yeah, we must be mother, careful what we pretend to be yeah mother, mother night, night. Yeah. yeah right because it's about a guy pretending to be a nazi right. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe that that is like the central point of Vonnegut's life. One of maybe two. The other one being uh. like people should be courteous, which has a lot more power and wisdom in it than you think at first. But yeah. man, that quote, there's so many proto versions of that quote in here. Like his thing is yeah. about pretension and perception. So just a quick, quick rundown. After this Luke Lubbock thing happens, Reverend Lasher, who represents the revolution and all it stands for, says, you know, I got to get a uniform so I'll know what I represent. And Paul says, or two, like Luke, and Lasher says, all right, okay, fine, two, but that's the most any human being should allow themselves, and like any self-respecting human being. Uh. And it just really reminded me of how, like, I have an alone self, and the only major difference is that I'm, like, more of a slob without, you know, <laughs> like, no one watching me. Yeah. And then I have, like, myself that's engaged and ready to be an active listener and, like, interrupt way too much and present to, huh. like, people around me. But that's like the most you should have. If you have a third, then you obviously have some kind of secret life going on. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but also just the idea of using your outer self to represent. So he also says, Anita asks if Ed had a good time at the party. He says he did, or at least he believes he did, and that's the same thing. Check how many of these quotes are basically, we must be careful what we pretend to be. Um, yeah. About Shepard, the guy who represents the person who's just aggressively using the system. The world Shepard lived in was a hard one, but he wouldn't have it any other way. So again, his perception is everything. About Lasher, yesterday's snow job becomes today's sermon. Which is almost like a Bocanonis kind of thing. Yeah. Like almost like, oh, these these good fake things. Uh, yeah, can harmless really lies. Yeah. yeah. And then last one, half the people or more didn't understand much about the machines they worked at, but they worked at them very well. Yeah. Which I would like to think I work at these machines very well, and I don't. Again, what's wrong with that? I read this on a Kindle. I don't know how this microphone works. <laughs> Fuck you, Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> Society s survived, yeah. But let's get into the ending, yeah. Sure, yeah. There's a um, lot there, too. I want to know your interpretation. Like, I'm not even sure what I think happened. <laughs> so Paul joins the revolution, but when he intends to join the revolution and says, I'm joining the revolution of the powers that be, they say, oh, great. Yeah, you're wink, wink, joining the revolution. Very funny. Great cover. So Paul gets himself kicked out of the job Meaning that he you're actually wants to get kicked out of. The Ilium powers that be. Oh, yeah. Just the for Ilium, the clarity yeah. of people who haven't read. Yeah, sure, sure. So the Ghost Shirt Society are the revolutionaries, then the Ilium yeah. representatives, the Ilium works as the company men. And yeah. he's like to them, I want to quit. And they're like, 
yeah, great. That's exactly the character that we've scripted for you. And he's like, no, really, I want to quit. And they're like, you're going to be a really good secret agent. Listen how committed you are to the role. Yeah. So, yeah. But meanwhile, the Ghost Shirt Society, literally under truth serum, is like, do you really hate the the way things are? And he's like, yeah, I do. And they're like, oh, he was telling the truth. Right. So by virtue of the fact that he's of both worlds, he can keep kicking the decision down the road. Yeah. Like, yeah. he still could go either way. <laughs> he's legitimately in the rebellion. And if he wanted to, he could puss out and say he was a double agent and run back to the arms of the government. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then his wife, Anita, leaves him for Lost and Shepard, Shepard, which they had all kind of set up throughout the book. And right, because Shepard represents happens. the ambitious one who's actually playing by the rules. She yeah. thinks those rules are great. So They're a much down. better fit yeah. for each other. Yeah. yeah. And then Paul and the ghost shirts, uh, the quick version is they, they go and break the machines and then in the process of break the machines they break all of the machines and they're like no but we can keep some of them people are Looting, like no right. yeah. we're not doing that they're like should like, we keep like the re automatic respirators that keep the babies alive and they're like wreck everything <laughs> <laughs> not that explicitly yeah but the implication is the looting of the revolutionaries goes way out of control right more than the leaders thought it would and it's also it's still kind of a comical revolution because it only happens in a couple of cities it happens in Ilium and I, I think Oakland and Salt Lake and most of the groups and chicken then, out. Yeah. yeah, and most of the other or groups in the major get cities. shut down. Right. And then after they've done this, they find a group of people. There's like a broken soda machine for this soda called Orangeo that no one likes except the guy who's in charge of all production. And so that's why they're Orangeo machines. But after the people have broken Which, everything... Which, I'm sorry, shouldn't the computers shut that down i thought the Which whole point of this system thing, yeah. was there was no inefficiency based on like well the boss likes this drink so we have to stock it <laughs> that's the exact kind of efficiency the computers would be like no it right. won't, it's not gonna sell no one likes it yeah well because i was thinking throughout like the one way this dystopia does get really really scary is if it's terminator and like the machines really do start running things like for yeah. themselves but oh, i don't think their it own ever best interest yeah but yeah. i don't think it ever hits that point it's like think still people in charge of like yes. like punch card computers and i think everything. vonnegut intentionally doesn't want it to be you're not scared of the robots you're right. scared of the fact that how could people do this to each other with machines? <laughs> right, right. And so the people, they're, they're with this broken machine to make a soda that no one likes, but people are like tinkering with it because everybody's become like a, either yeah. was an engineer or is naturally into engineering the society. And they're like, oh, I can't wait to re rebuild this machine. This will be so fun. And the people running the revolution realize that like, no matter how much they get people to break machines, even beyond the point of any sense, they're going to want to rebuild them and want to live this way. And yeah. so they go and turn themselves in to the authorities. I don't want to be overtly political, but the clearest analogy for me is they go like, oh, it's not Trump. It's the voters. <laughs> <laughs> right, and right. here's where I blow your mind. Like, do you think Vonnegut thought they're giving up because fuck it? Or are they giving up because... It's like the end of Star Wars 4 and it's the medal ceremony. I couldn't tell yeah, I if I was know. supposed to be happy or like Big Brother horrified. Well, I think in an earlier draft of the novel, there was like a final, final chapter where Paul comes back from jail after years and years and mm -hmm. like meets Kroner back at the farm. And they talk about how... And he Paul's... married to Hermione, finally. <laughs> <laughs> we flash right, forward. Right. <laughs> right. And his second son uses a time turner. To... <laughs> but then, and uh, Paul says he, w he became the librarian in prison. So he read a lot and he's become more philosophical. And he's like, ah, I hope people can hang on to their humanity and be more technological. Boy, that would be great. And so that is like, I feel like... <laughs> that must be what Vonnegut thinks. It's sort, of, it's, I, it's sort of cheating to say, oh, because of this thrown out chapter, that's what the ending means. But, but I, probably, I feel like yeah. he's too... <laughs> but also in, in terms of like, can he write a fully dystopian novel? I don't even know if he can. Like even in other books when like all the world's seas are frozen and mm -hmm. things like that, or, or like all humanity has mutated into like seal thingies and Galapagos. Like it, it's still kind of chummy and heartfelt and even after the world's ended that's the other thing about vonnegut that i think is so unique and special is to me he's like a he's like an m, &M dichotomy <laughs> m, m in his glory days <laughs> was fascinating because he was so fucked up and such a hateful person and then every other song would be him saying i know i hate myself too and you'd be like that's interesting yeah and i feel like vonnegut's <laughs> interesting because every book on the surface he goes like everything is bullshit Right. Humans are the worst. All we do. I lived through World War II. All I see is rape and murder. That's really all it is. Isn't it funny? You got to be nice to each other. Like he's somehow <laughs> also the most kind hearted. Like yeah. he very fervently believes that the world is a dark, dark place full of suffering. But he equally maintains his faith that 
I need to be nice and kind all the more. And he has that sliver of hope of like, I'm still going to tell people you should be kind because if we all did, it wouldn't be such a hellish place. So like, you can't get me, Vonnegut. You know, you <laughs> act dark, but you're not H.R. Geiger. Like, you do think there's hope. Right. Can I call out some images? Oh, yeah, yeah. That really got me? Uh, this is a segment called... Imagerama. Calling them out. Um, <laughs> Finnerty, sh title shout out, cracks a hard boiled egg on the player piano in the bar. Yeah, there's a, there's a bar in town, and like the, the town's divided up into there's a factory and then a river, and then like every, where everybody yeah. else lives, and there's a bar where everybody else lives that has a player piano. Yeah. yeah. And I, uh, I just love that as the image of like subverting a machine's intended use. Oh, yeah. It's like the most minor form of sabotage that he won't get arrested for, that he can get away with publicly, is taking a machine and using it for something unrelated. Yeah. I also love in that same scene, he's basically saying all the cynical shit that we just said Kurt Vonnegut believes as he's drinking. And then at the end, he says, my glass is empty. So just like the optimi old optimist pessimist thing, my glass is empty, uh, my glass is full. Yeah. And then... For me, the, the payoff that made it worth reading the book to me, well, no, there's a lot of stuff in there, but the ultimate champion in this book to me was he gets tried, right? Because Paul gets caught by the police, yes. briefly incarcerated, put on trial, and then, and then rescued, rescued quote, unquote, and they launched the by the revolutionaries, yeah. right? So all Paul wants and the reason he eventually switches over to the side of the revolutionaries is to be not automated. He wants to be a human. He wants to be living and be not a machine, not automatic. When he's on trial, he is hooked to a lie de detector of the future that's, like, perfect, we're led to believe. Yeah. So just literally all of his inner thoughts are apparent to everyone, <laughs> which is just <laughs> such cruel and unusual way to, like, have your law legal system work. So he's tied up to a bunch of wires to measure all of his neural impulses. Then the revolutionaries burst in and rip him out of the thing as they're telling him, that he's their messiah, and he says, this is so great, all I've ever wanted is like a thing to do, like a big thing to do with my life. They say, oh, you don't need to worry about that. We have all your speeches written. We have a really good PR plan that's going to roll out. Yeah. All you have to do is like sign your name at the bottom of all these forms. Then you're going to hide in a bunker doing absolutely nothing because we can't right. afford to have you die, and we'll just do everything for you. So <laughs> he's automatic again. He's like the automatic messiah that's not necessary. Yeah. As he is being forcibly moved from one location to another with strings attached to him. And he oh. even, Vonnegut even describes him as looking like a marionette, yeah. like earlier in the section. And I just think that's, oh, that was my favorite moment. <laughs> And they just needed his name. And also, uh, like, buried Easter egg is that the last name Proteus is part of the name of a guy, Charles Proteus Steinmetz, who, like, <laughs> so founded... So you got all this real-world shit. Yeah, he founded, the, <laughs> he founded the research lab at General Electric that Kurt's brother worked at and, like, had great times at because uh, the boss of it would walk around to all the researchers and say, are you having fun today? Are you having fun today? Are you having fun today? <laughs> and they would just develop anything they could. Yeah. And then it kind of shifted and got worse from there. Mm. But it it's like... Now I'm thinking maybe oh, Ed is his brother. Dudes. I could actually, yeah, I could see that a bit. Or like they're both kind of yeah, a combination. A of each combination, other. Yeah. yeah. But speaking of which, the analogous lab that Ed worked at and then gets fired from is uh, National Research Development Laboratory or Nerd Lab, <laughs> which I just enjoyed. <laughs> Did you have a favorite moment? Well, I think I you mentioned the trial and like uh, the trial to me is when one of the times when the book gets the most vonnegut -y, I would say. We were talking about Kurt needed to like kind of break himself down and find his voice by making Paul a character who's on trial and feels just fully exposed and feels pinned down by this lie detector. Also, then he starts talking like Kurt Vonnegut in a way yeah. that I expected him to be. And how classic of a conceit is it to be like well let's have a trial now so that i can have the two arguments that i'm presenting literally right. just go against each just other directly yeah. yeah it's a little blocky and i think my uh, i like there's a line um the main business of humanity is to do a good job of being human beings not to serve as appendages to machines institutions and systems and that's the thing that and, and it's literally a part in the trial where they're like they're calibrating the lie detector and they tell him to lie. And he says some he says something like all scientific progress is good. And it's like it says it's a lie. He thinks it. And then they're like, say something true. And he says that about people. 
And it's Supreme? it's such a it's such a like basic boiled down vonnegut. Big well. tits will get you in anywhere is in there. <laughs> oh yeah, <That's laughs> or it t- might be a different chapter, but it's definitely a quote in there. Yeah, is that with the prostitute lady? Maybe I forget. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's a weird bit. I think it's a fascinating novel in particular if you like vonnegut, but also just in general to see somebody who's so I think fundamentally not quite dystopian going yeah. for the most hardcore 1984 thing he can do yeah and i will say the closest he got to convincing me was in that trial scene when he says uh what distinguishes men from the rest of the animals is his ability to do artificial things and to step backward after making a wrong turn is a step in the right direction i was like well you're so good at words that i almost agree with you (laughs) but just the idea that there is such a thing as you know spiritual or social progress and technological progress And he's just sort of saying, no one's making us pursue technological progress as hard as we can. We can do whatever we want. In fact, that's one of the amazing things about being human. We could get together and decide to change society in this way or that way. So why be a slave to this system? And then the characters could rightly say, because you made us, Kurt. This would never happen in real life. But uh, (laughs) Okay, so here's the segment. The (laughs) introducing Vano. What? Very similar inflection to what you used for the last segment. but (laughs) So Vana Watt is where we cop to what I call the Rudyard Kipling effect, because Rudyard Kipling was my favorite poet growing up. And then I read the poem, The White Man's Burden, which is about black people, and And was very, very upset. And what a a pain they are. Well, but it was about how, like, it's uh, so misguided. He's like, stop being racist, you guys. They're really bad at everything, and they're poor (laughs) and helpless. We need to help them. You should feel pity for them. It's like, we don't need that kind of help, Rudyard. (laughs) Just back off, Rudyard. (laughs) So Vana what is where we talk about the sort of problematic areas, and I think we already touched on. I do think he gets better and better, and like even by the second book, Beatrice in Sirens is one of the best female characters ever, Yeah, and I think has a lot of self-agency. Yeah. But... Basically, the female characters are Catherine, who's like your classic, super airheaded, overly hysterically emotional secretary, literally. Yeah. And is and is is hooking up with another like engineer guy at, at the, the plant office already. just casually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anita, his wife, who he said is Lady Macbeth, basically. Yeah. And I'm just gonna throw some quotes out there. Anita was armed to the teeth with jewelry. She had combined <laughs> the female weapons of sex and taste with an aura of masculine competence. Right. So I love that he's like all the evil parts about her, very feminine, although that edge of like intelligence, very masculine. <laughs> yeah. And it's also it's so weird that so much of this book is very autobiographical about G and his life. And then Kurt's actual wife, Jane, like he he wrote her love letters for years in yeah. college and after that. And like they were like such collaborators on everything. And like they had such a wonderful, close relationship. And then his first novel, he's like, ah, shark woman. That'll be fine. Yeah. Well, it's that clearly a bad marriage all throughout. <laughs> yeah. Right. And like Finnerty berates her for not respecting the privacy of men. <laughs> when she like <laughs> pops her head into the office to see if they could use any refreshments or anything right he's like you must Perfectly respect nice. the privacy of men keep in mind this isn't in the 50s this is how vonnegut thinks it will still be yeah. in the future in the that's future. what's weird to me <laughs> at the meadows and actually tragically i wouldn't be surprised if this still happened at like a ge style company retreat yeah they pay some guy every year to like dress up as a caricature of a native american and yeah. like dance around doing Native American shit yeah. for all these old white men to be right. like, you're right. We do embody the noble spirit of the people we exterminated from this land. <laughs> <laughs> we are great. <laughs> like literally co-opting all the Native American culture and handing it over to the GE executives. Right. That scene was like rough. But I don't put that on Vonnegut because it's obviously supposed to be horrible yeah like he you know you in the book think it's awful as well it's especially because the finger lakes up there in new york that was like the seat of the iroquois confederation yeah. historically and so it's like a very traditional thing but then they're like great let's use that for yeah. making widgets but the one i want your take <laughs> on and be honest if it occurred to you while you were reading this is the one i really do put on vonnegut and like the times in which he was raised or wherever you land on that art versus time you were born in argument yeah. the shah brought poor i think is yeah. way too noble savage his whole function yeah. in the story is to have these really wise one-liners like he sees the machine telling all the humans what to do and the humans running around and he goes what do you call those people through an interpreter and the guy's like oh workers or citizens he says they're citizens sir you know because he's patriotic <laughs> and he goes ah 
Kurdishna or whatever made up word Vonnegut did for their language. And he's yeah. like, what does that mean? Slaves. So it's like, oh, like Shah of Bratpur often ends a chapter by going like, in our country, we would use this word to describe it. And it's Vonnegut's way of going, get it? Like they're slaves. Yeah. He's really there to like bolster the thesis. Yet he is like a befuddled dummy who doesn't know the most rudimentary like technologies as if they haven't yeah. reached his country yet and doesn't understand a lot of like basic things going on right? and just sort of bumbles around drinking constantly Heavily. and wondering if he can have sex with the women around. Yeah. Like, can I have sex with that one? Oh no. All right. What about that one? And I, so I'm like, uh, yeah. that bugged me or just well, that depiction. I agree. And I think there's also in brothers smiling, uh, they talk about that in real life, the prime minister of Pakistan visited GE and was like doing a tour of the U S oh, no. to like, see what America is like. So and this even is like, impression of like did the thing guy. of visiting an, a an average family home, quote unquote, cause that's a scene in the, in the Shah storyline yeah. where he visits a regular home. But Kurt went from like, Oh, the leader of probably a perfectly intelligent country who would like know things. Let's make him this cartoon. <laughs> that, that wasn't yeah. a great way to do it, <laughs> yeah. especially with him drinking constantly that he didn't need to do. <laughs> yeah, but I did like the, yeah, some klish, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. I did like his made-up language. Yeah, and and apparently he drew on his, like, study of linguistics in his master's ah, program. Cool. They'll do that. Figure that out. Token, but that's everybody. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was Vana What? Vana What? Vana What? Yeah. And that's, I think, mostly player piano. And it, yeah. it also, the science fiction elements of it, like uh, w when it came out, the book was not a very big hit. Like it got some relatively polite reviews and then it didn't sell particularly well. It was nominated for an International Fantasy Award in 1953, mm -hmm. which is not an award they give out anymore. But yeah. uh, a lot of the reviews sort of characterized it as a, oh, he's since he's trying to do Brave New World, this is science fiction. And then yeah. from there on... There's that Kurt Vonnegut line about like, oh, the critics see the science fiction drawer as a urinal and, and I shouldn't yeah. be in it. This book or is like sort of how he gets there. the bottom drawer and some mistake it for a urinal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And between this and then especially Sirens when, it, when they actually leave Earth and things like that. It's really... See, I wonder if he read Sirens when he was done and knew that it was the best book ever written. Because if so, <laughs> I would be justifiably like, ah, screw you guys, if it didn't do well. You know, or if or oh, anyone yeah. who didn't get it. It's kind of like... Nick Drake, apparently his suicide note included a lot of stuff of like, it's unfair that people didn't appreciate what a musical genius I am. Screw them. Really? You'll all be sorry when I'm dead. And it's like on one hand, that's very petulant and short sighted. Yeah. But on the other hand, have you heard Nick Drake? He Great. is fucking incredible. It's really good. And if people weren't saying it to him at the time, they should have been. <laughs> like he is a genius. Was. <laughs> Yeah, they blew yeah. it. <laughs> they really blew it there. <laughs> Could have had three more Nick Drake albums before he started getting shitty. <laughs> and here we go into our next segment called Related Reading. Reading flip, 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 Reading flip, books. flip, 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 read. Books. My eyes scan from left to right, top to bottom. <laughs> that was very Eurocentric, I'm sorry. <laughs> the mechanism of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you've never heard this name before, this is where we pick out amazing works by other writers that remind us of the themes or events or something else, and you might dig them. Yeah, automation, free will, related reading. Yeah. So I wanted to say another recurring theme in this podcast is I will always recommend Harlan Ellison. Yeah. There's a really good Harlan Ellison short story. Okay, there's four that I'm going to mention that all tie to player piano. A comic book series actually called Dream Corridor, mm -hmm. which I think includes within it an adaptation of a short story called The Silver Corridor, where, oh. uh, not to spoil it, but it's sort of like a virtual reality room you go into to settle debates or business problems yeah. with the opposing side. And it literalizes your force of will. So the VR experience constantly changes and shifts and you're always in competition with the other person. But you will do better or worse or suffer more or less based on your force of will. And whoever wins the argument in this society, it's considered like binding arbitration. Yeah. So you can do a hostile takeover of a company by like believing in your company's vision more than the other person oh, if you are in the room and that's how it goes down. So that's yeah. one. I don't want to give away, you know, the punchline. 
There's an incredible large print book called Repent Harlequin Said the TikTok Man. That's the name of the story. <laughs> Repent Harlequin Said the TikTok Man. Some of his titles, man. But Amazing. specifically, I suggest you get the giant version that's like beautifully illustrated because there's a big print version that's awesome. And that's about a society where, which has since been done as a movie, you have a limited amount of time allotted to your life and you can yeah. trade and buy and sell how much time exists left on your lifespan. Oh. And uh, there's a rebellion sure. growing to try and stop that practice because it's fucked up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then my last one for player piano, my favorite and the most Vonnegutian, it's called Knox. K-N-O-X. And, and Ellison usually is very loquacious and like flowery. He did, loves long sentences with a lot of words that are not strictly necessary, but that's what I love about him. <laughs> but Knox is the opposite. It's super vonnegut oh. So the literally the first lines are Knox, period. Knox was a man, period. Knox was a man who, period. Oh. Who had a mission, period. And the whole thing reads like that. It's about a dude living in a player piano society who never questions it and always believes in the society and is a patriot and is all about making sure his neighbors and everyone around him are loyal to the society at all costs. That's amazing. It's very good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's so even that's also very vonnegut, I feel like, to have a structure where it's like the structure is very visible, you know? And it's like, oh, you can see exactly the how the author was exactly, constructing it. Yeah. You know? Just that's as amazing. controlled as the society itself. Yeah. All right, you got My, a player piano one? Yeah, yeah, these are quick, but one uh, is a short story by Ray Bradbury. It's uh, one in The Illustrated Man, which is a collection of his, uh, which also has a frame and is amazing. Uh, but it's called The Velt, uh, so V E L D T. Yeah. And it's about a family that lives in a house, which is a player piano house. Like they bought a package that yeah. automates everything and handles everything for them. And it's directly that, but also it's called the Velt because there's an aspect where it can do a virtual reality thing through telepathy. And the kids are like, let's go to the African Savannah, the Velt, let's check that out. And I won't spoil the ending of it, but it's an amazing short story. And it was also written right around the same year that Player Piano was, I think it was 1951. And so that is very fascinating to see a contemporary author who also, in the Kurt Vonnegut letters I was reading, they started corresponding in the late Bradbury 50s. Bradbury and Vonnegut. Bradbury and Vonnegut, which is amazing. Yeah. Uh, just very exciting to me because I, I love them both. But that story is an amazing take on a lot of the themes in player piano. And the one other one is The Caves of Steel, which is a novel by Isaac Asimov. Asimov. It's one of the big hitters of sci-fi. You, you may yeah. know it if you follow it. But it is like player piano in that it's about a society that has everything it needs because of technology. In the Caves of Steel's case, everyone's moved underground, Caves of Steel, into huge cities. <laughs> but also automation is semi-replacing jobs, except in player piano, it's very much just unthinking machines are so powerful yeah. that they've taken care of things and maybe we'll have AI. But Caves of Steel, it's about a human detective. He loses his partner and his new partner is a robot detective, a fully yeah. thinking, feeling robot. And some so people credit of, it for inspiring know. Blade Runner or some of the tropes of Blade yeah. Runner. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very Bad and neuromancy. And good because it should and be a good. movie or something. Oh, yeah. Like it's uh, awesome, you know. Yeah, it should definitely be a movie. And you were telling me that the Westworld creator has admitted that that symbol is yeah. lifted, right? So also, according to, according to Vulture, Jonathan Nolan, who created or co-created Westworld, the TV show Certainly now on HBO. Certainly directs most of the episodes. Yeah, the, the <laughs> force behind it. He said that there, there's a player piano in the brothel saloon bar in Westworld, and the it happens to play like player piano versions of modern songs, which is fun. But he said that was specifically inspired by Kurt Vonnegut's player piano. Yeah. So if you watch that, how could that you not say that? I mean, that symbol right. is, yeah, right. Sim, it's the same symbol being used in the exact same way. Yes, <laughs> uh, to automate music isn't that to destroy the beauty of it? Right. It's so we direct. know we read player piano, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that's enough related reading. We got a lot more to cover. Get yeah. it? Reading cover uh, book cover <laughs> literature. Let's do, so we've, we've talked about the book. I think we can kind of wind things down. Also, I feel like this podcast can be a resource to you, the person living right now, because maybe you care about Kurt Vonnegut things going on in the world because they're constantly mm -hmm. those. Here's a segment for Vonnegut News. 
X-ray, X-ray, Vonnegut News, yeah. There's a a lot's happening in Indianapolis. There's a Kurt Vonnegut Memorial Library there, and they uh, successfully launched a Kickstarter recently. They needed a hundred grand, and they got uh, I think one hundred seventeen thousand. And oh, so they're going to move the to a horrors of automation. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's that so should have been a bake sale done with human hands. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so then robots are going to move them to a building, uh, like a much larger building at more centrally in Indianapolis as soon as they can, which will be great. And then also uh, New York City just had a musical version of God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater at City Center. Oh, I didn't know that. It's closed now, but it's a revival of a musical written by Howard Ashman and Alan Menken, who are most famous for doing a lot of like Disney stuff, like Little Mermaid and things yeah. like that. They did the songs for it. But if anyone saw that, I'm super curious. Is it good? I don't know if God Bless You, Mr. Oh, Rosewater too, would be yeah. an amazing musical or not. Well, I think the the classic Di- Mank and Disney era, if you take out that they're animated, just throw that out of the equation. Yeah. They're some of the best musicals ever written, regardless. Oh, absolutely. Like, they stand with Broadway musicals, of course. They're phenomenal. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. So it was probably really good, but I, I'm super curious about it. And, and if anybody saw it, let yeah. us know. I always wonder, though, because then at this point, this is like their 15th album. You know, some bands stick it out, but yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'd be very curious to know if you're like, Man, it was as good as goddamn Little Mermaid. Like it was, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the songs yeah. were that catchy and like memorable. The melodies were really stuck in your head. Or is it like, ah, they've done better. Right. <laughs> Late period. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, so that's those are things going on uh, in your world if you're uh, into Kervonget and especially in Indiana. Hoosiers. Uh, <laughs> for the Hoosiers out there. So yeah, thank you so much for listening and talking player piano uh, with us uh, in your head probably yeah. as we talked about it here. And it is a book club, so you might get, I mean, you don't need to, but you could get more out of it if you read our next piece, which is yeah. Sirens. Is that right? That's right. We're going okay. chronologically. Uh, we may kind of make stops for when short story collections and things like that came right. out, but we're going so novel by novel. reading Sirens of Titan. You will not be disappointed. Yeah, especially for it being only a second novel is amazing. It's really great. Yeah. This one still had a lot of interesting stuff in it, but it does feel like we were obliged to do it before we get to like, and boom, like we're <laughs> off and running because Sirens of Titan is like, it almost feels like it's five novels later because yeah. in this thing, he's still kind of like, I want to fit in with the crowd. And then he's like, screw it. Sirens of Titan. This is what Vonnegut sounds like. And he pretty much sounds like that for the rest of his career. And it's yeah. amazing. <laughs> and it's so good. Uh, so thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed player piano and we're taking on Sirens of Titan next. In the meantime, we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash Kurt Vonnegut. We're on Twitter at at Kurt Vonnegut and Instagram at at Kurt Vonnegut. We want this to be very book clubby and we want to talk to you about these books on the internet. In the meantime, see you next time. <laughs>